Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we will be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Philip someone or other, I've forgotten the name again. Nope, by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. She'll have to alter a good deal, answered Mrs. Metlock. And there's nothing likely to improve children at Misselthwaite, if you ask me. They thought Mary was not listening because she was standing a little apart from them at the window of the private hotel they had gone to. She was watching the passing buses and cabs and people, but she heard quite well and was made very curious about her uncle and the place he lived in. What sort of a place was it, and what would he be like? What was a hunchback? She had never seen one. Perhaps there were none in India. Since she had been living in other people's houses and had had no ayah, she had begun to feel lonely and to think queer thoughts which were new to her. She had begun to wonder why she had never seemed to belong to anyone even when her father and mother had been alive. Other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she had never seemed to really be anyone's little girl. She had had servants and food and clothes, but no one had taken any notice of her. She did not know that this was because she was a disagreeable child. But then, of course, she did not know she was disagreeable. She often thought that other people were, but she did not know that she was so herself. She thought Mrs. Medlock the most disagreeable person she had ever seen, with her common, highly coloured face and a common, fine bonnet. When the next day they set out on their journey to Yorkshire, she walked through the station to the railway carriage with her head up and trying to keep as far away from her as she could, because she did not want to seem to belong to her. It would have made her angry to think people imagined she was her little girl. But Mrs. Medlock was not in the least disturbed by her and her thoughts. She was the kind of woman who would stand no nonsense from young ones. At least that is what she would have said if she had been asked. She had not wanted to go to London just when her sister Maria's daughter was going to be married, but she had a comfortable, well-paid place as housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and the only way in which she, she, she could keep it was to do at once what Mr. Archibald Craven told her to do. She never dared even to ask a question. Captain Lennox and his wife died of the cholera, Mr. Craven had said in his short, cold way. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother, and I am their daughter's guardian. The child is to be brought here. You must go to London and bring her yourself. So she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. She had nothing to read or to look at, and she had folded her thin little black gloved hands in her lap. Her black dress made her look yellower than ever, and her limp light hair straggled from under her black crate hat. A more marred looking young one I never saw in my life, Miss Med Mrs. Medlock thought. Marred is a, is a Yorkshire word and means spoiled and pettish. She had never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything and at last she got tired of watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. I suppose I may as well tell you something about where you're going to, she said. Do you know anything about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father and mother talk about him? No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that her father and mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Certainly they had never told her things. <laughs> muttered Mrs. Medlock, st staring at a queer, unresponsive little face. Did she not say any more f sh sorry, she did not say any more for a few moments, and then she began again. I suppose you might as well be told something to prepare you. You're going to a queer place. Mary said nothing at all, and Mrs. Medlock looked rather discomforted by her apparent indifference. But after taking a breath, she went on. Not but that it's a grand place in a gloomy way, and Mr. Craven's proud of it in his way, and that's gloomy enough too. The house is six hundred years old, and on it, and it's on the edge of the moor, and there's near a hundred rooms in it, though most of them shut up and locked. And there's pictures and fine old furniture and things that's been there for ages, and there's a big park round it, and gardens and trees with branches trailing to the ground. 
some of them. <clears throat> she paused and took another breath. But there's, an there's nothing else, she ended suddenly. Mary had begun to listen in spite of herself. It all sounded so unlike India, and anything new rather attracted her. But she did not intend to look as if she were interested. That was one of her unhappy, disagreeable ways. So she sat still. Well, said Mrs. Med Medlock, what do you think of it? Nothing, she answered. I know nothing about such places. That made Mrs. Medlock laugh a short sort of laugh. Eh? she said. But, but you are like an old woman. Don't you care? It doesn't matter, said Mary, whether I care or not. You are right enough there, said Mrs. Medlock. It doesn't. What you're to be to be kept at Misselthwaite Manor for, I don't know, unless because it's the easiest way. He's not going to trouble himself about you, that's sure and certain. He never tro troubles himself about no one. She stopped herself as if she had just remembered something in time. He's got a crooked back, she said. That set him wrong. He was a sour young man and got no good of all his money and big place till he was married. Mary's eyes turned toward her in spite of her intention not to, not to seem to care. She had never thought of the hunchbacks being married, and she was a trifle surprised. Mrs. Medlock saw this, and as she was a talkative woman, she continued with more interest. This was one way of passing some of the time at any rate. She was a sweet, pretty thing, and he'd have walked the world over to get her a blade of grass she wanted. Nobody thought she'd marry him, but she did, and many, many people said she married him for his money. But she didn't. She didn't posit uh, she didn't, positively, when she died. Mary gave a little involuntary jump. Oh, did she die, she exclaimed, quite without meaning to. She had just remembered a, f a French fairy story she had once read called... Oh dear. Requie à la Hope? I'm sorry, I'm butchering that. Be uh, it had been about a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess, and it had made her suddenly sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven. Yes, she died, Mrs. Medlock answered, and it made him queerer than ever. He cares about nobody. <clears throat> he won't see people. Most of the time he goes away, and when he is at Misselthwaite, he shuts himself up in the West Wing and won't let anyone but Pitcher see him. Pitcher's an old fellow, but he took care of him when he was a child and he knows his ways. It sounded like something in a book, and it did not make Mary feel, feel cheerful. A house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up and with their doors locked. A house on the edge of the moor, whatsoever a moor was, sounded dreary. A man with a crooked back who shut himself up also. She stared out of the window with her lips pinched together, and it seemed quite natural that, it, that the rain should have begun to pour down in grey slanting lines and splash and stream down the window panes. If the pretty wife had been alive, she might have made things cheerful by being something like her own mother, and by running in and out and going to parties, as she had done in frocks, full of lace. But she was not there any more. <clears throat> you needn't expect to see him, because ten to one you won't, said Mrs. Medlock, and you mustn't expect that there will be people to talk to you. You'll have to play about and look after yourself. You'll be told what rooms you can go into and what rooms you're to keep out of. There's gardens enough, but when you're in the house, don't go wandering and poking about. Mr. Craven won't have it. And with that, we come to the end of the episode. Oh, bloody. Um... Yeah, so I'm going to say, I've forgotten what I'm going to say. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, 
no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.